full. I don't know how many we had, but we, I mean, both sides were just full. And we were missing, I can't, we were missing uh, the Messers, we were missing the Maltry, we were missing several. We'd had about 15 more and everybody had been here. But uh, we were packed this morning. So this morning was a great success. And I appreciate everybody who uh, helped out with that, invited people. I had a few visitors. Some of the visitors I had lined up didn't come and all that. But anyway, we enjoyed the service this morning with those five saved. All right, anybody else got a testimony? All right, well, let's take our Bibles tonight. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 tonight. And uh, I am preaching a message tonight that I've been excited about preaching. And um, it is a controversial message, I'm sure. Uh, but it's not controversial with the Lord. Everything I'm going to show you tonight is going to be straight from the book. Nothing but the book. And so I think that tonight's message is very timely, especially the day and age we're living in. And so I want you to listen very intently tonight. Get a pen, get a paper, get your Bible, write down notes, take notes, because what we're going to dig in tonight, there's a lot of scripture, and I'm going to preach quick. I, yeah, listen, if you'll listen quick, I'll preach quick, okay? So uh, we'll get out of here in a timely manner. We'll be out of here, what, see, see, it's 523. We'll be out of here by 7 o'clock, no doubt. That was a joke. Somebody say amen. All right. Let's stand for just a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 24. Now let's get a, let's get a context here. If you look at uh, 1 Corinthians 7 verses 1 through 5, we find Paul is talking about the husband and wife relationship and not defrauding one another and uh, to avoid fornication. Let every man have his wife and every wife have, his, uh, uh, hu uh, have her husband. All right, then we find that Paul talks about in verse 8, it's good for a man, uh, uh, it's good to be, to, uh, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. So Paul said if you're unmarried or if you're a widow, it's good to just remain that way. Then we find in verse 9, but if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Then we go down, and we'll look at these verses here momentarily, but then we find in verses 10 through 15, we find a situation of a divorce. We find a divorce that takes place, uh, circumstances around a divorce. Then we find in verses uh, uh, 25 through roughly the end of the chapter, we find Paul dealing often, uh, talking about virgins and, and things of that nature. So it's interesting. I want you to read verse 24 now. Look at verse 24. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called, therein abide with who? God. Look at verse 20. Back up and look at verse 20. Let every man abide in the same what? Calling wherein he was called. And then verse 24 again. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called, therein what? Abide with God. So it's interesting to me that in the same chapter we find Paul talking extensively about marriage, divorce, all that, uh, virgins, the widows, and all these verses we find about marriage in the slap middle of the chapter we find Paul twice saying whatever you've been called to do though, that's the calling you need to abide with. Interesting, isn't it? It's very interesting to me that not one time in these verses, in this entire chapter, do we ever find God encouraging, permitting, or forbidding any man. He, never one time do we find God ever telling any man in, this, in these verses to step down from what God called him to do because of any type of marital situation. And stay with me. This is the book now. Douglas saw for Wednesday night, so aptly put it, he was, we were talking Wednesday night uh, at supper, and he says this. He says that I believe, Douglas Stauffer said this now, one of the greatest evils of this age is telling Christians that they have to step down from doing anything just because they've been divorced. I think that's an interesting statement. So tonight I'm going to preach a message entitled, Divorced But Not Demoted. Divorce, but not demoted. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you, Lord, for letting us be in church tonight. God, I pray that as we study these uh, uh, truths out of your word, that you would get honor and glory out of them. 
Father, I pray that most of all that maybe somebody here would be encouraged. Maybe, Lord, uh, there's somebody here that they've been struggling with a call to preach or maybe a call to teach Sunday school or call to go to the mission field. I don't know, whatever it may be. Lord, I pray tonight that you would settle us. Lord, this is a very serious issue. Many people are affected by the uh, divorce in these days that we're living in. So, Lord, I pray that you do a work in our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, you can be seated. Now get out your pen tonight because we're going to look at a few things concerning this matter of divorce. All right? Uh, divorce affects over 50% of America's population. For a long time, the church did a lot better than the world as far as the divorce rates. But slowly but surely, the church world is beginning to catch up with the lost world in the divorce rate. I believe it was in 2014, one out of every five divorce papers had or uh, contained the word Facebook. So that means that 20% of all divorces in the actual papers <coughs> contained the word Facebook. A divorce is running rapid. And my friend, uh, divorce is one of the, it's number two. It is the number two uh, stressful event in uh, somebody's life that can happen. I, I, I didn't look up number one. I just remember marriage. reading about, ma yeah, yeah, marriage. Marriage is number one, divorce is number two. Amen. But I want us to notice that because divorce has touched almost everybody in here. And somewhat, you may not be divorced, but maybe you married somebody that was divorced. Or maybe you've gone through a divorce. Or maybe your parents were divorced. Divorce has touched, I think, I'm looking around, everybody in this room. Now, understand this about divorce. We're going to look at some things about divorce. I've got six points with a few sub-points under each one of those points about divorce, and we're going to look at what God's Word has to say about divorce. All right, number one, if you're taking notes, number one, write this down. God hates divorce. Yes. He hates it. Look at Malachi chapter 2 and verse 16. Malachi chapter 2 and verse 16. All right. I should hear some pages turning, amen. Malachi chapter 2 and verse 16. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 2 and verse number 16. Look at what it says. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he what? Hateth putting away. Now, putting away is the Bible, one of the Bible terms for divorce. So we find here the very first point about divorce is that God hates it. God hates divorce. We need to understand number two, number two about divorce, that God's original plan was for a man and a woman to stay together until death. Go to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19 tonight. Matthew chapter number 19, and let's look there at verse number uh, 3. Verse number 3. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 3. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and what? Female. All right? We could stop there and preach a message. He made them male and female. All right? God makes males and God makes females. Okay? That means if a male is born a male, he needs to be what? Male. Well, I tell you what, you've got a better education than a lot of college professors nowadays. That's right. And that means that God intended for who to get married? A male and a female. As the old adage says, it wasn't Adam and Steve, it was Adam and Eve, okay? <laughs> anyway, I could go on on that, but I, I don't want to get bogged down. All right, now look at what it says in verse 5. And said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be what? One flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined what? Together, Together let no man put asunder. So Jesus is saying, that when God joins a man and a woman through the bonds of marriage, and by the way, I don't want to get graphic tonight, but we understand that a marriage doesn't happen on an altar with a preacher and a marriage certificate. A marriage happens sometime a couple of hours afterwards, okay? The Bible says that Jacob had Leah. They went into a tent. He went in under her, and she became his wife. Everybody understand what I'm talking about? Okay. In God's eyes, 
Flesh joining to flesh is marriage. All right? Now, notice verse 7. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of what? Divorcement. And to put her away. Now, I want you to notice verse number 8, because verse number 8 transitions us right in to uh, point number 3. So, number 1, God hates divorce. Number two, God's original plan is for a man and woman to stay together until death. But now I want you to notice verse 8. So they say, Lord, if God's original plan was to have a man and a woman stay together until they die, then why did God even give Moses the writing? Why did he, why did, was there even a divorce uh, uh, in, in the, under the law in the Old Testament? Why did God even give that? Well, look at verse number 8. He saith unto them, Moses, because of the what? Hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. So number three, point number three, sin is always the cause of divorce. Sin is always the cause of divorce. Now let me clarify something here. It may not always be a two-party situation. What I mean by that is it may not always be both parties wrong. You ever met two individuals that were married and you're sitting there thinking, my goodness, why are those two people together? You ever thought that? Now, once you get married, you just need to try to make it work. I heard somebody say one time, well, I married outside of God's will. Well, as soon as you said, I do, it was God's will. Amen. So sometimes you just got to make it work regardless if you like the person or not. But now I want you to listen to me. There are times where not the, what there is a person. You, you hear these guys who say, well, she left him. I wonder what he did. Well, did you ever think that maybe he didn't do anything? Maybe she was just a whore? Yeah. Somebody say amen. Yeah. Well, he left her. She must have been unbearable to live with. No, he may just wanted to be sleeping around somebody. Somebody say, I mean, if I tell the truth tonight, somebody say amen. amen. Sometimes a person has no control over what the other individual did. I've seen guys that were as good as gold have their wives leave them. Yes, sir. I've, know, I've known of women who were as good as gold and their husbands just left them. So understand, sin is all... And then I've met some people that I'm saying, no, y'all need to stay together. I don't want you ruining two other households. Amen? <laughs> so understand this. Sin is always the cause for divorce. He said, because of the hardness of your heart. In a perfect world, there is no divorce. But we understand that we're not living in a perfect world because there are no perfect people. And because sin enters into lives, there's divorce. Now, when a divorce happens, when there's a tragedy where a marriage has to end, and, I'm, and, 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 and you're going to see here, I, I'm going to count a divorce as when a marriage ends, okay? When two, two people are no longer married, I'm going to call it, now we, you can argue semantics, and that's fine. I'm not dogmatic about this, but there are three scriptural reasons on why a marriage ends. There are only three scriptural reasons for a marriage to end or a divorce to happen, okay? Number one is death. Now, understand this. I understand that a person dying, that may not technically be a divorce, but for sake of just the points here, the outline, if you want to call it that, we're going to call it, a marriage ends, the first scriptural reason for a marriage to end is because of divorce, or excuse me, is because of death. All right, go to Romans chapter 7. Go to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, and I want you to notice there at verse number 1. Romans chapter 7 and verse number 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Verse 2. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he what? Liveth. But if the husband be what? Dead. She is loose from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another. Now what is marriage? So yeah, it's flesh joining flesh. That's why 1 Corinthians 6 says, He that joineth himself to a harlot is one flesh with the harlot. Alright? 
So we understand this here. So if the and while her husband, the, uh, the guy she's married to now, if she goes out and cheats on him and becomes married to another, she shall be called what? Uh -huh. An adulterer. But if her husband be dead, so he's dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. So the first biblical reason for a marriage to end is what? Death. Death. That's a pretty obvious one, isn't it? Yes. My spouse dies, and I hope she doesn't, but if she dies, I'm I, am, I am by the scriptures allowed to marry another one, and there's no sin that's happened. That makes sense to everybody? All right, good. I didn't think there'd be any debate on that. All right? Second reason for a man, for a, a, a scriptural reason for a marriage to end is adultery. Adultery. I want you to go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Now here's the thing. Now I, let me say this. What I just said, that a scriptural reason for a marriage to end is, by, is death. One scriptural reason for a marriage to end is death. There's nobody in the world that's going to disagree with me. Nobody. Nobody. You take the Sword of the Lord crowd, they're not going to disagree. You take the Rutman crowd, they're not going to disagree. You take the Sammy Allen camp meeting crowd, they're not going to disagree. You take any click or clan you can think of in the Independent Baptist movement, and they're not going to disagree. But if you go one step across the line of saying that any other reason for uh, ending a marriage is scriptural, they're going to bam, no. They're going to say, no. There's no other scriptural reasons for a marriage to end except death. Well, now, wait a second. Are we Bible believers? Yes. Uh, somebody say amen. amen. We believe what the Bible says exactly as the Bible says it. Yes. All right, well, then let's look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 32. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away what is put away mean? Divorce. Divorce. Whosoever shall put away his wife... Saving for the cause of what? Amen. Fornication. Causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth what? Adultery. Now we're Bible believers, right? Yes. So the Bible says that if I put away my wife for any other reason except for the cause of fornication, I'm committing adultery if I marry another. Does that make sense? That means, though, that if my wife decides she's going to go find her another man and marry him and have an adulterous relationship with him, I am free from that law. Yes, right. That's what the book said. Now, I wasn't raised it. I was not raised believing this. Yes. I did not preach or teach this because I didn't believe it for the first several years of my ministry. But you can't get around the book. Go to Matthew chapter number 19. Let's look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 19. We've already been there. Let's go there again. Matthew chapter number 19 and verse number 9. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, What does putting away mean? Alright, divorce. Except it be for what? Fornication and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. So understand this, folks. If you're in a marriage and the person that you're married to went out and had an adulterous relationship and committed fornication with somebody else, you are free if you want to be. Now, of course, the ideal thing, if it's possible and it's within you, reconcile with that person, get back together, forgive them, and move on. But if, it, if you ain't got it in you or the relationship's too far gone, you've got every biblical right to divorce that person. And you can marry somebody else, and you have not committed adultery. That's what the book says. No way around it. Is that, I mean, is that, is that black and white on paper? I mean, is that black ink on white paper? You better believe it's black ink on white paper. Hey, it's as clear as the nose on your face, man. Yes. All right, now, let's go to the third reason of why a person can end a marriage. Notice there, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. The third scriptural reason for a marriage to end is the desertion of of the unbelieving, when the unbelieving departs. Alright, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 
1 Corinthians chapter 7. All right, let's notice there in verse number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. Paul's writing here, he said, And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from what? Her husband. He said, I do not want any wives to leave their husbands. He said, that's a command. Look at verse number 11. But, and if she, what? Depart, let her remain, what? Unmarried. Or be reconciled to her husband. And let not the husband put away his wife. So understand this, God forbids, strictly forbids the husband and wife relationship then. He said, I don't, you, I don't want you to do that. Now we understand there's an exception clause in Matthew 5, except for the cause of fornication. But what he said, he said, I, I, don't, I don't want your marriages to end. Don't split up. Verse 12, but to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. Verse 13. And the woman which hath an, a, a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. Now listen to me, listen to me well. That means that if you have got a husband and a wife, are the boys back there? I keep hearing something back there too. And I'm not. Yeah, there's somebody. Boy, and we're live streaming our Facebook services tonight. Praise the Lord. There's somebody back there. Go check that out. Praise the Lord. It's youngins, whoever it is. Just tell them to go out back the other way. All right, praise the Lord. All right, now I want you to notice. Are all the youngins accounted for? Oh, oh, okay. It's more. Whew. All right, Facebook Live, you'll never get anywhere else here but Bible Baptist Church. People breaking into church trying to get in. Amen. All right. All right, now I want us to notice this here. Notice this here. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Notice what it says there. It says that if a husband or a wife has an unbelieving spouse, if that unbelieving spouse is pleased to dwell with that person, the saved spouse is not supposed to divorce the lost spouse, okay? That's what it says. Is that what it says? Absolutely. But now I want you to notice verse 14. <coughs> for, the un for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Now I want you to notice verse 15. Here's our third reason. There's only three. Here's the third one. But... If the unbelieving depart, let him what? Depart. Now, I want you to listen. If you've got a lost spouse or your spouse says, you know what? I don't want to serve God anymore. I don't believe in God. I don't have nothing to do with church. I don't have nothing to do with God anymore. I'm done with this Christianity business. Listen to me. If they depart, the Bible says, let them. If you used to get counseled by 9 out of 10 fundamentalist Baptist pastors nowadays, though, they'd be saying, oh, you need to go and try to read. You need to keep them. You need to grab them by the legs and beg for them to stay with you. The Bible says let them depart. Now, the reason why that makes us so nervous ooh, when I say that is because we've been programmed. But this is what God's Word says. Let them depart. Now, I want you to notice Verse 15, a brother or a sister is not under what? Bondage. Bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. Hey, listen, if you get a, if you got a spouse who says, I'm not serving God anymore, I don't want anything to do with church, I don't want anything to do with God, I don't want anything to do with that Christianity business anymore, and they depart, or maybe you got married and both of you are lost, and then you got one of you got saved, but the other spouse didn't want to get saved. The Bible says if they leave, you're not under any bondage. But if you talk to 9 out of 10 fundamentalist pastors, they say it's a sin for you to get remarried. Not according to God's word, it ain't. And God help us for us to look at a man who got married. Both of them were lost when they got, uh, when they got married. And then he got divorced. Even this. And then they, he got divorced before he got saved. And then he got saved and married a good wife. And they're godly and they're serving the Lord. And, but uh, they'll look at that man and say, because you got married and divorced,
Marsh, why you is still lost. You can't ever stand behind my pulpit and do anything. Am I telling the truth? That's how it is, isn't it? Yes, it is. 100%. Every one of those pastors are putting an unbiblical standard and bondage and yoke of bondage on these people. All right, let's move along here. So we have... Well, number one, God what? Hates divorce. Number two, God's original plan is for a man and woman to stay together until death. Number three, sin is always the cause of divorce. Number four, there are three, three scriptural reasons that end a marriage. The first one's death. The second one's adultery. The third one is the desertion of the unbelieving. All right? Point number five. Point number five. A person who is divorced does not sin by getting remarried. See, I used to, I, I, I'd have people call me from time to time and say, Preacher, we want you to marry us, but I need you to understand I, I've been divorced. I'm divorced. And I'd say, nope, can't marry you. And I was taught that. I mean, I was taught that to, to, to oppose that vehemently. Don't you ever marry anybody that's been divorced before. You're, you're getting in on the act of adultery. Yeah. All right? You're still in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. All right, I want you to notice there at verse number 26. I'm sorry, verse 27. 1 Corinthians 7, 27. All right, now let's look what it says. Art thou bound unto a wife? So what that means, are you married? Are you bound unto a wife? Seek not to be what? Loose. So if you're married to a wife, don't seek to be loose from that marriage. Don't try to get divorced. All right, but look what it says. Art thou loose from a wife? Do what? Seek not a wife. So if you, if Paul says... That if you are loose, if you're, have you been married and now you're no longer married, don't try to get remarried. But look at verse 28. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not what? Sin. Now let me say this. If you divorce your wife, because, you know, I hear people guys say all the time, when my wife's turning 40, I'll trade her in for 220s, you know, all that kind of business. If you, if you divorce your spouse just so you can go find you a younger, better looking one, you remarry, that's adultery. That's right. But look at what Paul says. Paul says if you are <laughs> loosed from a wife, if you're loosed, there are only three scriptural reasons that a man and woman get loosed. It's death, adultery, and the desertion of the unbelieving. And if, those, if one of those three things have happened, you are loosed from a wife. That means that if you remarry, you have not sinned. And I've had a umpteen people say, let's talk about virgins. Now, they can't prove that. And, and we know it's not talking about virgins, because look at verse 28. And if a virgin marries, she hath not sinned. So obviously, the first part of the verse of verse 28, but and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned, that's talking about somebody who's been loosed from a wife based upon verse 27. Because the next phrase, and if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the what? In the flesh. Hey, that means if you get married, you're going to have trouble in the flesh. Paul says that those who are married care for the things of the world, but those who are not married care for the things of who? The Lord. And we understand the practical aspect of that. So understand this. For a person who's been loosed scripturally from a marriage, if they remarry, it's not a sin. All right, let's move along. I'm at the last point here. All right, point number six. A person who is divorced and also who has been remarried after the divorce, as long as it's for a legitimate reason, has no limits to their service. You ever heard this phrase, well... I don't think a man who's divorced ought to pastor. Yes, sir. You ever heard that? Oh, yeah. I don't think a man who's divorced ought to be a deacon. I don't think a man who's divorced ought to teach Sunday school. Now, some guys don't go that far, but I know some who have. Yes, well, if a man's divorced, I mean, uh, that's such a bad testimony. I mean, that the pastor's the highest office in the land. If a man's divorced, I don't think he ought to be serving in the, bishop, in the office of a pastor. Well, that's funny. When did you disqualify God? What do you mean disqualify? You just disqualified God from pastoring any Baptist church. You know why? Because God's divorced. 
I told that to a guy one time, Brother David, we was driving down the road in, in Wyoming. I thought we was going to, I thought that car, he said, what did you say? I said, God's divorced. Yeah. Oh, buddy, he got mad. He said, wow, I heard. And I read the verses. There are verses. Go to, go to Isaiah chapter 50. Yeah, God is divorced. Isaiah 50. Now, I'm, I'm going to guarantee you, I'm going to get so much flack off this Facebook Live business from a bunch of dummies that don't know how to read their Bibles. The reason why people have such a shock and awe when I say that is because they've been raised up with the tradition of man and not with the infallibility of the Scriptures, what the Scriptures say. I want you to look at Isaiah chapter 50. Thus saith the who? The Lord. So who's talking here? The Lord. Where is the bill of your mother's divorcement whom I have put away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities have you sold yourselves, and for transgressions is your mother what? Put away. Is God divorced? Absolutely. And you know what Israel's sin was a few steps? In fact, go to Jeremiah chapter 3. Go to Jeremiah chapter 3. Just one book over, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 8. All right, Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 8. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed what? Whew. Hey, what was one of the reasons why a man could get divorced? Adultery. Adultery. I had put her what? Away and given her a bill of divorce. <laughs> Understand this, God's divorced and he divorced Israel for the exact same reason he said a man could get divorced in Matthew chapter 5. It was for adultery. Are we Bible believers? Yes. Is God divorced? Yes, yes he is. You better believe. If you say God is not divorced, you're denying this book. You're a Bible rejecter. All right? So, if, if God is divorced, that means that a lost person, or excuse me, a lost person, a divorced person is not a second class Christian. Because God's not a second class God. Amen, 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 amen. I wouldn't, I wouldn't sit under a divorced man. Well, if you sit under God, you are, you're sitting under one. I know that, that does something to my stomach too, but that's just the book, ain't it? Amen. And I believe it regardless of whether it feels right or not. That's right. So God was divorced, and then under that, 1 Timothy 3, I want you to go to 1 Timothy 3, 1 Timothy 3. Because he, here's, the, here's the ending part. Here's where the whole conversation always ends up. And I get asked this all the time. 1 Timothy 3, verse number 1. All right, well then, Brother Sluter, do you think a man who's divorced and remarried can what? Pastor? Do you think he can be a pastor of a church? Well, the Bible in 1 Timothy 3 lays out some very clear qualifications for a pastor. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read these, I'm going to read these verses exactly like 9 out of 10 fundamental Baptists read these verses. Here, I, I'm going to read 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 1. Here's exactly how every fundamentalist reads these verses. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires the good work. Verse 2. A bishop then must be blank, the husband of one wife, blank, blank, of blank, 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 not given to wine, blank, 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 Huh? Is that how every fundamentalist you know reads those verses? Hey, I've met a whole lot of guys who aren't given to hospitality. 
I met a whole lot of guys who wasn't of good behavior. Hey, how about that app to teach there in verse number two? I know a whole lot of pastors who ain't apt to teach, especially when it comes on the idea of marriage and divorce. Yes. Let's look at what it says. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of what? One wife. Now let me clarify. If you ask them, they'll say, well, he's been married before. He's got two living wives. He's been divorced and remarried. Wait a second. If me and my wife are married... And she commits adultery on me. The Bible says I'm loose from that. She is no longer my what? My wife. So if I marry another woman, how many wives do I have? One. I have one wife. Everything okay over there? Yeah, it's just your power. You're good. All right, we're good. I have one wife. Now, you say, but preacher, I thought if a man and a woman got married, they were, in God's eyes, they were married until one of them dies. Well, let's see if the, if the Bible holds true to that. Go to Hosea chapter 2. Hosea chapter 2. It's in the Old Testament. Hosea chapter 2. Hosea chapter 2 and verse number 2. Now, we all know the story. Hosea is commanded to go get a wife. She's a harlot. Her name is Gomer. Well, wouldn't you like to have a harlot for a wife whose name was Gomer? Amen. Hey, man. Hey. I've met some interesting names, but I've never met a woman named Gomer. Anyway. I've met some too. Yeah, yeah. All right, now, Hosea chapter 2. So, look at what it says now. Or, excuse me, listen, listen to the story. Hosea takes a wife of whoredoms. God says this is a type of me taking back Israel. I'm getting a wife of whoredoms. But what does Hosea's wife do? She goes back into sin and commits adultery and goes back playing the harlot. Look at what it says in Hosea chapter 2 and verse 2. Hosea, plead with your mother. Plead, for she is not my what? Wife. Neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. Understand this now. Listen to me. Listen to me. Hosea said she's gone out and played the harlot. She's cheated on me. She's joined her flesh to another flesh. She is no longer my wife, and I am no longer her husband. Does that sound like a marriage lasts until somebody dies? No. That sounds like the marriage lasts until something comes along that makes the marriage end. That means that if my wife ever cheats on me, or I ever cheat on her, we ain't no longer husband and wife. I can scripturally lose myself from that marriage. All right? Now, the husband of one wife. Hey, listen, that verse in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2, that's not a verse about never getting divorced or remarried, and if you do, you can't ever hold an office. That's a verse against polygamy. Right. So I was talking about. I ain't supposed to have two wives. I'm supposed to have one. And I know, listen, I know that we get mocked and ridiculed for that, but Brother David's right. That means one at a time. Right. Now, if a man, if a man is getting married and every six months divorcing, he may want to reevaluate if he needs to get married again, okay? Mm -hmm. But I want you to listen to me, listen to me well. I, it's not my job to go around disqualifying men and telling them they need to step out of their pulpit. That ain't my job. God's a big enough God. If he doesn't want them in that pulpit, he'll remove them. All right, now. And if they're not removed, and you, and we, of course the old adage is, well, does God want Joel Osteen doing what he's doing? No, but Joel Osteen's still doing it. God, listen, we, we don't understand the mind of God. It ain't, listen, it ain't my job to go down there and jerk old Joel Osteen out of his pulpit. That's his pulpit. He knew it. Listen, the beauty of being, and I know Joel Osteen ain't an independent Baptist, but the beauty of being an independent Baptist is we can do what we want to, amen? And the independent Baptist church down the road, they can do what they want to. All right, now, let's go back to our text. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 24. Let's go back to it. Now here's it. I'm done tonight. I'm done. I want you to listen to me. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 24. I'm done, but I want you to listen to me. 
Go back. In fact, let's go back to verse 20. Or verse 20. Look at what it says. Here it is again. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was what? Called. So if you've been called to do something, you're supposed to abide in that calling. Verse 21. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. Look at verse 22. For he that is called in the Lord being a servant is the Lord's what? Free man. Likewise also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Verse 23, ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of who? Men. Listen to me, listen to me very carefully. Anybody who has ever stepped down and quit serving God because they got divorced or because they got remarried after a divorce, you are putting yourselves as the servant of men. God never intended you to quit serving him in any capacity just because you got divorced. Amen, 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 amen. amen. Verse 24, here's the last. Right after we find that Paul says, you are bought with the prize, be not ye the servants of men, he says, brethren, let every man wherein he is called, therein abide with God. Listen to me now, I'm done. Listen to me. A man who is divorced has no right to quit preaching just because he got divorced. Somebody say amen. That's the truth. A man who is divorced and then gets remarried has no right to quit preaching just because he got remarried after divorce. A man who's pastoring and he has a scriptural reason that that divorce ended and he was not the one in the wrong. He has every right. He does not have the right to step down from that pastorate unless, you know, God leads him to or he feels like he needs to. But there is nothing in the Bible that forbids him from stepping down or from keeping on pastoring that church. And there's nothing in the scripture that forbids him from getting remarried after that divorce. Brethren, let every man wherein he was called Therein, abide with God. Divorce should never stop you from serving God in any capacity. Right. Ever head down here, right close, nobody looking around, my wife, and come to the piano. There's some of you in here, you've been divorced. I've never stopped anybody from doing anything because you've been divorced. I've never stopped anybody from doing anything because they were divorced. We're going to go ahead and end the live Facebook broadcast. Thank you guys for listening in. We're going to give the altar call now.